We have some wristbands left. Where the wristband person is right there. Three dollars to help the children um, of Darfur who have been displaced to Chad. Um, just, I can just say them if you want to. Sure. Um, and we'll be, we know that you guys donated a lot of money last week to, for um, the Rwanda relief efforts, but we're going to be passing something around. And if you could just donate a dollar or 50 cents or whatever you have, um, all of the money will go to Darfur Peace and Development Fund that's establishing schools in refugee camps. Um, and all the money we raised today is going to go to that. And then tomorrow, if you live on campus in the Sauvignon Village, there's a barbecue. And we're having this Pie Your CSA event. And um, so it costs a dollar to throw a pie at your CSA. And um, all of that money will also go to the Peace and Development Fund. So if you live on campus, um, that's another way to get involved. So that's it. Thank you. Mm -hmm. You noticed I didn't volunteer for that one. Um, any other announcements? Okay, as I mentioned, we have the final exam. Be passing it out. Um, it will be due next week in lecture on Tuesday, and we can discuss it in, in section. <coughs> we come to what has become a, a very important part of the lecture series every year, and uh, that is our second generation panel. And uh, the consequences of having a parent or parents who were Holocaust survivors um, are significant and uh, we find them an important thing to think about. Uh, each year, uh, our own Dean Leader, who is the child of Holocaust survivors, agrees to have a panel for us. And for those of you who don't know Dean Leader, Elaine Leader came to us yay many years ago now. Um, she's a sociologist. She is extremely um, aware of issues around the Holocaust and in fact has studied the Holocaust on a postgraduate level. Um, she has been tremendously supportive of this course, this lecture series, and of me personally. And for that, I always like to acknowledge her because it has meant a big difference in my life and in the life of our program. So without ado, I turn you over, I turn you over to Dean Leah. Sorry, I like it close to my mouth. Um, we are expecting another guest when she arrives. Hopefully she'll arrive. Um, she is the second generation, but we're honored to have the first generation and the third generation with us, so they might be stand-ins for her. Um, let me start out by saying I know many of you uh, who have taken classes with me, and uh, many of you have never heard my story. Uh, about my father um, or why I do this. So I'll say a bit about it. Um, but let me preface this conversation. Oh, good, she's here. <laughs> Come on up and have a seat. Seat number two, three, right over there. Um, I'll preface this by saying that my entire life, I've always been drawn to the dark side. Um, as a child, I got involved early on with the civil rights movement, and after that with the anti-war movement, and after that the battered women movement, and the child abuse movement, and the slavery movement, and the anti-slavery movement, and the anti-Holocaust. And I never got why it was that I was drawn to the dark side until um, about six years ago, when I was lucky enough to be invited to the U.S. Holocaust Memorial Museum in Washington, D.C., where I was a visiting scholar. Um, and it was at that event where I was learning how to teach the Holocaust, and I had chosen to teach the Holocaust, um, when I started to piece the get together the story of my own family's life. Now, I had always known that my father had left Lithuania in 1939, and I'd always known that his family didn't survive. That's all I knew. 
My father kept secrets. I know that after World War II, he looked for his family, he didn't find them, but we never talked about it. So I didn't know a lot. And as I began to study the Holocaust, I realized that my story was not unusual and the fact that I knew nothing was also not unusual, although the women up here have other stories to tell. Um, and we're going to be honored today to hear their stories as children of survivors. Um, but my story, I never considered my, my father a Holocaust survivor. He was a refugee and in the Holocaust scholars and Holocaust background, there's a pecking order of misery. And people who were in the camps were the ones who really suffered. The rest, if they got out in the kinder transports, if they got out or they were partisans, if they got out as refugees, then they were the lucky ones. And it was only after reading for a number of months that I discovered that those of us who are children who lost their families in the Holocaust are also impacted by that. Scarred, I wouldn't call it, but I would call it impacted. Because those of us who are the second generation are the memorial candles. And it is our job, and you'll hear the same story from my colleagues here, it is our job to bring testimony to the world Soon, I mean, the, the survivors are dying off. My father's been dead for 20 years. Many of them are very old. We are very lucky and privileged. You are lucky and privileged to have been able to meet survivors. But they're often now in their 80s and their 90s. And so it is the next generation, the second generation, the third generation, and then the fourth generation to carry the stories of what happened in Nazi Germany and in all the other countries that were impacted by the Holocaust. So as I began to read, I discovered that my story was not unique. My father, I'll just tell you very briefly what happened to him. There was money for one family member. It was 1939. Everybody knew what was going on in Germany. Everybody knew that Hitler was gearing up for war. Where he was going to go, some people knew, others did not. They knew, everyone knew, what had happened in the 1930s in Germany. And so there was money for one family member, and the money was sent to my family in Lithuania, a little village called Kupishak. Um, and the money came, and it was supposed to go to my aunt. But my grandfather was ill, and my aunt was a devoted daughter. And she also said to my father, you go first and go to the United States, set up what you can, an outpost, get ready, bring us over. So my father left with a visa that was in fact in her name. Um, and he went across Germany and he was accompanied by a Nazi soldier actually, got to the other side of Germany, he was coming from Lithuania, and he got to Britain and came on the boat, came to the United States, that was 1939, I was born in 1944. In 1940, 1941, everything went silent. The war broke out, Hitler did what he did in Germany, in Poland, and the troops marched further and further east. And they eventually got to Kupishak, Lithuania, where we found out only four or five years ago that what happened, or at least I found out four or five years ago, my father knew all of his adult life after he found the story out. What was happened, what happened was that my relatives, my grandfather had died by then by, about the, by the illness that had um, taken over that kept my aunt back. Um, but my grandmother, my uncle, and my aunt were taken out to a pit with a thousand other Jews from this little village they dug this pit, and then they were all shot, along with the other thousand people. It was covered, the ground was covered over, and that was the end of the story, except that there was one public health nurse in the next village who, after all of these atrocities took place, went from village to village to village and took the names of the people who died. 
and listed them on records which were kept in the village uh, archives. And when I went to the Holocaust Memorial Museum in 1990, 19, I'm sorry, 2000, I started to scroll through the villages looking for Kupershock. And I found Kupershock, and then I hit that, and then I hit another button, and all of a sudden came up the death list with my family's name. Now, we'd never seen these records. My brother didn't know about them. I don't believe my father knew about them. I went back, started to do some homework, discovered, in fact, that there was a, not a um, Lithuanian army officer who had come to the United States in the 1950s under false pre pretenses, alleging not to have committed any atrocities, and that the US Department of Justice was now prosecuting him in the year 2000 for the atrocities that he had committed in my, the little village where my family came, from which my family came. And I then spoke to the Justice Department, found out that the man decided to leave the United States, which he did so that he wouldn't be facing um, export, uh, deportation. Um, and then I just read in the newspaper just about a year ago that he died over there. So that was the little story that I heard. It's a big story, but it was an aha moment for me. Why am I drawn to the dark side? Why do I always want to know about battering, abuse, child abuse? Why do I care about racism? Why do I care about slavery? Why do I care about genocide? Why do I care about social injustices? Why has my entire life been dedicated to trying to undo that which we just heard goes on on a regular basis in the world? So then I started to do the literature review, and luckily enough, I'm looking to my time to be quick, I found a lot that was written about children of survivors and children of refugees. And the first person who did the work on this was in the 1960s. It was just soon after the war, only about 15 or 20 years after. Um, and her name was Helen Epstein, and she wrote about children of the Holocaust. And then lots more studies have come out. And it's very interesting because you would think that children of Holocaust survivors would continue the trauma, that in some way we would be traumatized by the experience. But remarkably enough, the literature indicates that many of us, in fact, are quite resilient, have good mental health, and in fact, really see ourselves as having to do something in this world to make it a better place. So there's a project now that's going on in uh, Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, at University of Pennsylvania, called the Transcending Trauma Project. And they study generations of survivors. And of course, they've been studying the Holocaust. But now they're also starting to look at survivors of the Cambodian genocide, the Rwandan genocide, the Armenian genocide, to see what happens to children and to families after all of this. And it turns out it's all very, very interesting that um, there really are family types. And I'm going to give you this typology so that when you hear the stories of the folks who are up here, you can decide which typology they might fit. The first type of family are those families that are called the NUMB families, N-U-M-B. These are families who have, are really silenced by the experience. They deaden their emotions and really only tolerate um, minimal stimulation. And I worked with a colleague whose mother what, had been numbed out by her experience. She had been in the camps and her experience was so traumatic and so horrific and she herself was a fragile human being so that the rest of her life, her family spent trying to take care of her because she was victimized by it. And they were numb to the whole experience. They didn't experience trauma. They didn't experience anything except taking care of mom, who was a victim of this, this whole genocide. Um, and they don't tolerate much. So they are the numb families. Fortunately, they're in the minority. There are also families who were called the victim families. These are people who, after the war, they came to their homes and came back and were 
depressed by the whole experience. And that, that deadening depression carries on through the generations. These are folks who were worried, mistrustful, fearful of the outside, and in a way they cling to each other because they're the only ones who were left in the world. And so as they have more children and live on into the next generation, there's a sense of still being victimized. They too are in the minority. You'll find the next two family types very interesting. There's the fighter family. Now the fighter families were often people whose families were in the resistance. And so by being in the resistance, these families learned early on to fight back. And the fighter families have a drive to rebuild, to achieve and to change their lives. And so they really are uh, active, in comp almost compulsive, in proving Hitler to be wrong and to show the rest of the world and themselves that they are going to, what is it, living well is the best revenge? Living is the best revenge? And so they are going to fight their way through life in order to survive this experience and move into the next generation. And then there are, and these are the majority, the families who made it, all right? These are the folks who want to make it big, or they want to make it good. They're folks who have experienced the genocide. They've come out of it, and they are now at a place where they are going to aspire to good education to social and political status, to wealth, maybe. Um, and there's the sense also that they are going to live fully and justify and, not justify, but enjoy their life experience because they were almost obliterated. I have a colleague that I know who fits this one very well. Um, came to the United States with nothing, Holocaust survivor, soon started to parlay money, fame, wealth, and at this point is a very, very well-known entrepreneur in, on the East Coast. So there are folks who really want to make it well. So usually the children of these kinds of families, particularly those who really want to make it and make it not big, but live a good life, um, carry that message into the next generation. So I'd like you to think about this as we meet the folks that are about to tell their stories. Um, one of the other themes that is particularly noteworthy is that um, there, well, let me just say this. There are many studies, and in fact, Blair told me she's going to cite studies that don't fit her life at all. And in fact, there are many studies that indicate that Holocaust survivor children are resistant to stress. They don't do well with stress. Um, they, some of them, in fact, decide that they're not going to be Jewish because to have been Jewish means that one was going to die. So rather than to embrace the identity as Jewish, they go the other way and become completely assimilated. But as variable as there are human beings, so too is the variability of the response to having been Holocaust survivors' children. There's a lot of diversity in the way that families uh, experience it. Um, let me say, that, and I don't want to take a whole lot of time, that um, clearly there are families who, as a result of um, been, having been Holocaust survivors, cling very closely to their faiths and remain dedicated, if not to religious Judaism, at least to secular Judaism, and a strong sense of identity. And um, many of them, particularly those who maintain a sense of identity with their religion, had close, strong Jewish identities before the war, and then as soon as they got out of the camps, or however they survived, they go back to that sense of belonging to an ethnic group and a religious identity. So I don't want to prolong this much 
So I'll, I'll really introduce the rest of our speakers very briefly. The next person who's going to speak is Blair Pleasant, um, uh, whose father was a, is a daughter of a, whose father was in the Lodge ghetto and also in Auschwitz and in a labor camp. Then we're going to hear from Shelley Bauer, and I am eager to hear her story. And then we will also hear from Estelle Ross, whose um, mother, Helen, was under the Nazi occupation for a few months uh, and was caught between borders, and whose father was in, um, from Poland and served in the army. And uh, we're going to go next to Blair, and then to um, Shelley, and then Estelle. Thanks. Any questions? Thank you, Elaine. I've been fighting off a cough, so hopefully I won't have a coughing spasm while I'm up here. But uh, Thank you all for having me. Um, I am the proud daughter of a Holocaust survivor. Uh, my father, Leo Schweitzer, is from Ludge, Poland, and he survived the Ludge ghetto and then Auschwitz and several labor camps and the death march. Uh, my mother was born in America, so she's not a survivor. And as you'll hear some of the other stories, I'm, I'm thinking that possibly my story might be a little different because only one of my parents is a survivor and not both, so there might be some differences from that. So let me give you some background about my father and uh, his family. In 1940, my grandfather uh, had a foreboding or of uh, things to come, so he left Poland for Russia to try to find a place to uh, set up so that the family could go. And unfortunately, he got caught and arrested by uh, the Russians and was sent to a Siberian prison where he spent the rest of the war. So he did not go to the camps. He was in a Siberian prison instead. Uh, in the meantime, they were starting to uh, set up the Ludge ghetto. Ludge was one of the largest cities in Poland with a very large Jewish population. Uh, so you, you'll be hearing about different ghettos, but Ludge isn't as famous as Warsaw, but um, it, it definitely was one of the larger ones. So my father clearly remembers the day that the trouble started. He was coming home from what's the equivalent of our middle school, and he was wearing his new school uniform and was so proud and went home to show his mother his uniform. And instead, he found his mother sitting outside on the doorstep with all their uh, household belongings, the mattresses, the pillows, the pots and pans, and pretty much everything from their apartment. And it turned out that the Germans had come in, and uh, my grandparents had owned one of the, actually, they owned the building, and they had a, a luxury apartment and the German officers decided to come in and take the apartment for their own. So my mother was kicked out with all their belongings, so they were able to move in with um, my, my father's uh, grandparents for a little bit. But then they uh, started the Ludge ghetto, so everybody in all the Jews in the town of Ludge were sent to this ghetto where there were about 200,000 Jews living in small cramped quarters surrounded by barbed wires so the people couldn't get out. And they were there for qu quite a long time. And from what I understand, you know, the food was very lacking, and they had to work in different types of uh, labor camps. My father was working in a metal factory. So as you'll hear the story, that gave him some experience for what was to come. And then in 1943, they liquidated the camp, and my father and the rest of his family, with the exception of his father, were sent in the cattle cars to Auschwitz. And it, when you talk to some survivors, even though the camps were awful, many of them say that the cattle cars was actually the worst part of the experience. And I, I know one friend of my father's, when we were walking through the Holocaust Museum in Washington, when we got to the part with the cattle cars, he just broke down. The other parts he was able to take, but the cattle cars just brought on too many bad memories. And people were there for days, and the dead bodies were just laying around, and there was no place to do anything. There was no food, no water, and it, it was pretty horrendous. So when they got off the cattle cars, they uh, arrived at Auschwitz, and the men went to one side, and the women went to another. And that was pretty much the last time my father saw his mother. Uh, she was sent to the gas chambers after that, and he never saw her again. So my father uh, was able to stay with his brother somehow. One of the things that they tried to do at the camps was to separate the families, but somehow my father and his brother were able to stay together, and that really helped their situation. So he knew that one way to get out of Auschwitz uh, alive was to uh, volunteer for work at a labor camp. So when uh, one morning the guards came and asked, does anybody 
uh, know how to work in a metal factory, my father and his brother immediately raised their hands. So that experience uh, from the ghetto actually did come in handy. So they were able to go uh, work in this metal factory. So they went to this labor camp uh, where they got to make um, parts for planes and tanks for the German army. And that was their way out of Auschwitz. So they were in the labor camp for quite a while. And again, very little food, uh, terrible uh, dwellings, but it was certainly better than Auschwitz. Uh, toward the end of the war, the Germans knew what was coming and they wanted to liquidate uh, the labor camps and everything else. So they sent the prisoners on the infamous death march, which I'm sure you heard about. So the prisoners marched about 30 miles a day with only a bowl of soup or actually water with maybe a potato peel or something in it. That's what they call soup. And uh, possibly a piece of bread if they were lucky. And they were just wearing the striped pajamas, regardless of how cold it was out outside. They had no coats or anything. They just had the striped pajamas. And they started with about 500 people on the march, and by the end, there were about 40 or 50 people left alive. Uh, during the march, um, one of the men who was walking in the, the row or in, in line with my father, he started falling behind, and the people who fell behind or fell down would immediately get shot by the guards. So my father and his brother were on either side of this man, and they you know, helped drag him along for you know, however many miles. And to this day, that man, Irving, calls my father the person who saved his life because if he had fallen down, the guards would have just shot him. And it, it's nice because they're still friends now, and uh, when they get together, it's very special and very meaningful. So a few days later, the Russians had liberated uh, the prisoners, and my father was free. So my father and his brother survived, and one cousin and one uncle survived, and pretty much that was it. Everyone else uh, in the camps was exterminated, and he lost all his, his grandparents, who uh, actually, uh, one set of grandparents died back in uh, the ghetto, and his other grandparents died in the camps, and his aunts, cousins, uncles, everyone else was exterminated. So uh, my, my father claims that he survived based on pure luck, and if you talk to any survivor and you ask, how did you survive, generally the first thing they'll say is, it was luck, I was just lucky. And I'm sure luck had a lot to do with it because you, know, you could be standing here and not there and that person got shot and you didn't. So luck certainly did have a part to play, but I think there was also more to it. I think the people who survived did have that will, that, that desire. Uh, there, there was something inside that just pushed them on and had them keep going. And he was also smart enough to know that uh, he should volunteer for jobs and to work at labor camps to, to get out of Auschwitz because the very few people who had to stay there actually made it out. So after liberation, my father spent a couple years in Hanover, Germany, where there was a Jewish camp and uh, a lot of people got uh, back to their health and back on their feet there. Most of the people who he met in Hanover eventually immigrated to the United States and to New York and uh, many of them were also from Ludge, and when they arrived in New York, they joined the, uh, Ludger's, Benevolent, the Ludger's Young Men Benevolent Society, which is still in existence, and actually my father is the president of it right now. So when it started, it was more of a benevolent society. Well, it still is, but it, it wasn't a survivor organization, but as time went on, it, it really has become more of a survivor organization, and they collect money and uh, do fundraisers for Israel and for different organizations. And my father's been the president of that for the last couple years now, and I think this is going to be his last year. He's ready for a change. Uh, so those people who are in the Ledger organization have really become my extended family. Uh, the people who we met in Hanover and uh, also who uh, went to New York and Florida and became part of the uh, survivor organization really did become our extended family, and many of them are very, very close. And I, I have great memories of going to the Catskill Mountains once a year, every Memorial Day weekend for the Ledger event, and just seeing all these people together and uh, just enjoying life and dancing and having a good time and knowing that they made it. Uh, so these people have a, a, a certain closeness that comes from the shared experience and knowing that they survived together, and they really are an incredible support mechanism for one another, and it's great to see them together. And at family events, you know, they're at each other's uh, children's weddings and barn bar mitzvahs, uh, barn bat mitzvahs, and they, they really have become this family and support for each other. 
So now we'll talk a little bit about being second generation. And uh, Dean Leader did say that there are many different types of uh, people and the way it's been affected. And I, I think, I, I'm, as you hear my story, you'll, you'll know which one of the typologies I fall into because it's pretty obvious. Uh, my, my aunt, uh, who my father's brother married, uh, is definitely one of the, um, what was the second one? The, de uh, the depressed. The depressed. Absolutely. The victims. Absolutely. Whereas my father is uh, in the last category, so that's the way it affected us. So I, I do think that the way the Holocaust affected the parents or the, uh, the survivors greatly impacts the way it, it affects the second generation, certainly. And my father was always very open with us. Whenever we asked questions, he didn't try to hide it from us. He was very open with us and would answer our questions you know, to the best of his ability. But he didn't bombard us with it. He didn't give us the gory details. And in fact, until uh, the other day when I was uh, re-watching his video that he did for the Steven Spielberg uh, survivors of the Shoah, I didn't even realize that uh, his, his mother was beaten for uh, by the Gestapo because one of the neighbors told, told the uh, Germans that my grandmother had some diamonds and some jewelry hidden in the cellar, so they came and beat her to find out where it was. But that story he didn't tell us growing up. He, he kind of hid or uh, kept some of the more upsetting stories from us. But again, he, he would talk to us, and when we asked questions, he would relate them to us. But again, he didn't do it in a way to make us feel guilty or to make us feel bad or to make us feel depressed. It was more, this is what I went through, and I'm here, and you know, it, it was a part of me, but it's, it's not, I'm not going to dwell on it, and I'm not going to be a miserable person because of it. So he, he didn't try to burden us with it, and he tried to give us a good life and make up for things that he didn't have as a child. So basically, he tried to spoil my sister and brother and I, and that was fine with us. And he, he really did what he did, what he could to give us a good life, to make sure we got a good education. You know, college wasn't even a choice. It was, you know, which grad school are you going to? So college was definitely, you know, because he could only go into uh, the equivalent of his middle school. So carrying on an education and making sure that we all had um, an advanced degree was very important to him. So somehow my father had found ways to come to terms with his experience, but in a way that didn't make his children feel uncomfortable about it. And I do know that there are many cases, such as my aunt, where it's more depressing and you know, if the child does something that ma makes the parent unhappy, they'll say, for this I survived uh, Hitler, and you know, say things that'll make the child feel bad. And my father never did anything like that. Uh, and, and he never expected us to be perfect children or to make up for the life that he missed. You know, he wanted us to be happy, of course, but all parents do, but he didn't expect us to you know, be the perfect children to make up for his, his losses. So he, d he did make it easier for us to deal with this second generation. And I, I think that uh, my siblings and I are relatively normal. We don't have any of the syndromes that uh, the Helen Epstein book talks about and that some of the other books talk about. And uh, just the other day I read a study called The Impact of the Holocaust on Survivors and Their Children by Sandra Williams of the University of Central Florida. So when discussing the children of survivors, uh, the study notes, on interviewing the children, certain themes begin to emerge as characteristic of the parent-child relationship. These themes were the unavailability of the parents for their children's emotional needs, the extremely controlling and overprotective behavior of parents, and the induction of guilt feelings in the children. The most outstanding feature of all was the parents' inhibition of their children's separation. The parents communicated the idea that the only thing of value left in their lives was the children. And this was certainly not the case in my family. So, I, again, there are different types of survivors and the way they dealt with things. Uh, so there's no one way of looking at survivors or the children of survivors and saying, aha, you know, that's what a child of a survivor should be like. Because certainly what this study found is nothing like my family. And in fact, my father bent over backwards not to be like that. And uh, the study talks about separation. And when I graduated college, I grew up in New York and I wanted to get as far away from New York as I could. So after college, I decided to go to Colorado and I knew that my father wouldn't be that happy about it, but he supported my decision and he even supported me financially and uh, emotionally. Even though I, I knew it was something that he wasn't really behind, he knew that it was something I wanted to do and it was important for me. So even though it did mean separation, he was supportive of it. 
so th throughout my life, I've always had very special feelings for my father, as I'm sure you can hear from what I'm talking about today. And I, I was always very proud of him, proud that not only did he survive the camps, but that he came out not bitter and not depressed, but just a wonderful, loving, caring, generous man who everybody, when they meet him, they just love him. He's just a very wonderful, warm person. And to know that he's able to be such an incredible person after the experience he went through just really restores my faith in humanity. Uh, so even though Hitler might have tried to destroy my fa or did destroy my father's home and family, he didn't destroy my father's spirit. And one of the things that I learned about being the child of a survivor is the, fa uh, the value of family. And I remember hearing the ledger saying, you never know who your friends are because they can turn their backs on you, but you always know who your family is. So that's become a very important value to me today. And I try to instill that in my children when they're doing their sibling rivalry thing and fighting, but I, hopefully one day they'll, they'll get it. Uh, one thing I do is I do try to teach my children about the Holocaust, and I, I want them to know their history and understand who they are and where they come from. Because being the child of a survivor is a very important part of my identity and a part of who I am. So I want my children to know about that. And I'm very proud to say that my son Robbie recently uh, just won first prize in a, a Holocaust essay contest uh, for local teens. And he wrote an extremely beautiful essay that uh, some of the people who were at Yom Hashoah got to hear him uh, last week. So he, he wrote a great essay about um, the Holocaust remaining a faithful Jew uh, and about my father. And it, it's clear that um, my children are aware of their legacy as third generation. Uh, so I, I'd like to quote a paragraph from my son's essay. Can you tell him I'm a proud mother? <laughs> So he wrote, I am part of the third generation, the grandchildren of Holocaust survivors. My grandfather survived the concentration camp Auschwitz, as did one other member of his family. I don't recall where or when I first learned about the Holocaust, but I do know that ever since then, it's been important to me that when my grandfather and all the other survivors are gone, they are not forgotten. Later in his essay, he writes, I remember how I felt when I watched my grandpa's video and listened to him talk about what he went through when he was in the Shoah. I was incredibly impressed at how he could not only survive through that hellish camp, but still remain a faithful Jew. I was touched by how he could remain faithful to his religion, despite all the pain he and many others were forced to suffer because of it. While there are many people in this world who gave up on their faith after the Holocaust, and those that never learned to smile again after such torture, my grandfather is still Jewish and proud, and every time I see him, he always wears a smile. So it's clear that my son understands his legacy, and I couldn't be prouder. Uh, my, my children's Jewish education is very important to me, and even though we're not particularly observant, it is important that we pass down the traditions. And my father is one of those, what I'll call twice a year to synagogue Jews, you know, he only goes on the high holidays. But Judaism and its traditions are very important, and we're continuing that on in my family. And uh, it, it was very special for my father a couple years ago when my son had his bar mitzvah. One of the traditions is to pass the Torah down from generation to generation. So my father passed the Torah to me, and I passed it on to my son, and that was just a very special moment. And next month at my daughter's bat mitzvah, we'll do the same thing, and I'm sure it'll be just as meaningful. So I, I believe that educating people about the Holocaust is very important, and I do what I can to help. Uh, I've nudged several of my relatives to participate and to do these uh, Spielberg Survivor of the Shoah videos, and several of them have. And I'm also on the Yom Hashoah Committee, and I have been for 10 years. And I also try to talk to people and friends about it because talking to people, it, as opposed to having people just read about it in books, it, it makes it so much more real and it, it, it makes them understand a lot better. Uh, last year when I was preparing for uh, this talk, I found an article written by Rabbi Yaakov Solomon, who was the child of a survivor. And the article was about his ex experiences growing up and he basically echoed many of the same things that I've said today. He writes, I suppose that in my own naive way, I was decidedly unaware that there was anything special or distinctive about being a child of Holocaust survivors. Everything so, seemed so normal. In fact, it was. And he said that his parents wanted him to blend in, be normal, forget the past, and look ahead. And that's definitely true in my family. So he recounts uh, that finding out as an adult that um, his father testified at Nazi war criminals' trials. Uh, he witnessed these incredible uh, uh, atrocities that were just too horrendous for him to talk about. Uh, and at the end of the article, uh, Rabbi Solomon writes, 
Daddy, I have spent many adult years wondering what really happened to you before 1947. I believe it is something that all children of survivors would look, be well, do well to look into. But looking back now, and knowing that I'm now privy to but a speck of the terror you lived through, I say thank you. Your loving shield was a blanket of normalcy for two little boys who love you. Life was good, I recall. You made it that way. And today I echo those feelings, and I also say thank you, Dad. So thank you. I'm very honored to have been asked to talk here about my feelings of being a Holocaust survivor, a, holo a child of Holocaust survivors. You could tell I'm a little nervous. I haven't done this in a long time. I grew up in Petaluma and really never experienced any anti-Semitism. However, I remember my parents talk a little bit about their lives and what happened to them. My mother, who I'm proud to say is here with us today, came from a small town in Prussia named Marin Verde, which is in outskirts of Germany. She always spoke about her life as a young girl as being very protective and happy. Her father was a respected shopkeeper and a World War II veteran. And her mother was happy being a housewife and caring for her family. She went to school in this little town until right before Hitler came to power when she was no longer allowed to go to school there anymore. Her parents sent her to Berlin to live with an uncle. She was in school there until the time came for her to get a profession. She became a surgical nurse and worked in the Jewish hospital in Berlin. And to this day, she still keeps up her nursing license even though she's retired. And in this Jewish hospital is where she met my father, who was her patient. She eventually escaped from the hospital when she learned the Nazis would be taking the nurses to Auschwitz. She escaped in a hearst, carrying out the dead. She lived underground and in hiding for many years until being captured in November of 1944, where she was taken to, <coughs> to Reisenstadt but housed in the Klein of Festo, which means the little fortress. This was a death camp. She was liberated from the gas chamber on May 5th, 1945, by the Russians, a pr um, which was, by the way, the last day of the war. Approximately two, two years later, she, after she met with my father again in Berlin, she came to the U.S. and ended up being chip chicken farmers in Petaluma. My father was from a small town in Poland where he lived with his mother, two brothers, and a sister. He eventually left Poland to find a better life and went to Germany, where he operated a lumber yard. When Hitler came to power, this business was taken away from him because he was a Jew. He also lived underground and in hiding for many years until his capture in 1944. He was taken to Sachsenhausen and Ravensbrück concentration camps. <clears throat> he was liberated shortly before my mother in April of 1945. Unfortunately, my father didn't speak about his experiences too much, so I don't have as much information as I would have liked. He was more unable to speak, more depressed. As a child growing up in Petaluma, I always knew I was slightly different from other children. My grandparents, all my friends had their grandparents and spoke of them a lot. I could never speak about them since they were gassed in Auschwitz. Being Jewish was also difficult for me to admit because I always thought if I told anyone I was Jewish, I would be taken to a concentration camp also. I longed to, be, to live like other kids and celebrate Christmas with all the trimmings. I was brought up in a more traditional house, not overly religious, just enough to know I was Jewish and about my roots. My parents were very protective of me and I knew it was difficult for them 
to let me do a lot of the things other kids my age were doing, such as riding a bicycle or even getting a driver's license. I remember my mother said, let's go get the license, but don't tell your father. <laughs> my parents moved to Petaluma in 1950, and as other re uh, refugees that came there raised chickens. Eventually, my mother opened a nursing home in Petaluma, and those patients in the nursing home became my grandparents, my surrogate grandparents. I pretended that they belonged to me because I didn't have grandparents. Now that I'm older, I can understand my feelings a little bit more and know why they were the way they were. As an adult and also a parent of two children, and I'm proud to say my daughter's in the audience, I realize how, how important family unity and closeness is. I'm very proud to say that my mother is always happy to speak to students of all ages about her experience, which I know is difficult for her at times. She does this because she believes it's important for people to understand what happened during this horrible time. I also want to let you know that I chaired the Holocaust Memorial celebration, or not celebration, Holocaust Memorial for over 12 years because I feel it is important to memorialize the people who perished during this horrible time. Thank you for asking me to speak today. to three ways that being a child of survivors has affected me. My passion to tell my mother's story to the world in uh, the book that she wrote and in movie form, my passion for the support of Israel, and my passion to refute anti-Semitism. I'm not a public speaker, so please bear with me because I'll be reading to you instead of talking to you. So. Since my mother passed away, passing her story around the world holds most of my focus right now. It took so much for her to write a book about these 10 years of her life so that she could leave a record for the world. It's my mission to let others, others know what her life was like during these years of losing her entire family, falling in love, marrying my father, having a baby, and surviving alone in war while my father was in the Polish division of the Russian army. Immediately after the war, my parents and sister were forced by the German government to live in the home of a Nazi family. Pretty strange, yeah. Um, I'm compelled to have my mother's story told and her book shared. On 9-11, she watched the news all day. She told me that it was another Holocaust. We didn't know who Osama bin Laden was yet. She said Iran, Iraq, and Syria have attacked us. That night, she went to sleep in excellent health and had a fatal stroke. Her book, came, her book had come out a few weeks before, and she had not yet read the review from her friends. They, they were in the process of reading it. To give you a little of my Polish family background, my mother was one of six children. My father was one of seven children. My mother's grandmother lived with them. I was told my father had a sister that lived nearby with her husband and child. Everyone was murdered by bombs, Treblinka concentration camp ovens, gassed or at the hands of the Nazis, except for my mom's brother and my father's sister. Now all of them have passed. I went to the 60th anniversary of the end of the Holocaust two days ago in San Francisco. There were 450 survivors from the Bay Area. They were all quite old and fragile and will probably be gone soon like my parents. Many of their individual stories will either not be told or will be recorded in history books. 
Someone there said that whenever you witness a survivor or hear their story from their children or grandchildren, you too become a witness for future generations. The second way being a child of two extremely loving parents that were survivors has affected me has been to appreciate and support Israel because Jews all over the world had nowhere to go during the Holocaust. No country would allow them in. In order to escape the mass industrial scale murder and concentration camps, including the United States. In 41 or 42, there had been, if, had there been an, a, a place to escape, millions of deaths could have been prevented. Now there's a place the Jews can go to if the world turns against them again. It's called Israel. Even after the exterminations of six million, countries were not opening their borders to Jews that had survived the horrors of humankind. Nearly one million Jews were thrown out of the Arab countries that they lived in, Egypt, Syria, <coughs> Libya, and others. Jews don't live in Arab countries. Did you ever wonder why? In 1951, when I was born, the majority of the Israeli population was Mizrahi, that's Jews from Arab lands. Both the Christian world and the Islamic world had massacred and expelled their Jews, who in turn found sanctuary only in Israel. When my mother, father, and sister, and Jewish refugees from all over Europe wanted to return what, to what was their homeland since 586 BC, British controlled Palestine would not let them in. My mom's cousin's ship headed for what was called Palestine. The British blocked them and forced them to turn around and go to Cyprus instead of disembarking. Two or three ships later, the ship Exodus was followed to Israel by British ships and was also blocked with 4,550 refugees on board. British police boarded the, boarded the exodus. The Holocaust survivors were beaten, some people were killed, and the ship was sent back to Germany. Jewish refugees from Germany were not allowed to enter other countries, including the US and British Palestine. My family was in a German forced labor camp at the time, in Germany, of course. The media got wind of photos of the British attacking, attacking Holocaust survivors after the war, and countries were claiming that the British were acting like Nazis on the Exodus ship. So international meetings were held to determine what to do with the Holocaust survivors that had no homeland and no country who wanted them. Jews that lived in Palestine, Palestinian Jews, organized and fought the British to allow survivors back to their homeland. The international world pressure made Britain relinquish its control of Palestine and divide it into two areas. One part was for the Jewish people that had been driven from their land by the Romans, Egyptians, Christians, Babylonians, and Arabs. Some remained in the neighboring region. Many of the Jewish people that were thrown out later returned to their homeland and were the majority religion in Jerusalem in, by 1844. Uh, Arabs had arrived in the Arab invasion centuries after the, this historically accepted presence of Jews in the area. These Arabs would have the other part of the land. The Jews and Arabs were both Palestinians because they both lived in Palestine. The British already gave a large part of Palestine to Arabs in 1921. It's now called Jordan. Now, again the Arabs would get another piece of land that had been previously taken from the Jewish people. European countries, including allied countries, did not want the Jews to return, so it was easiest to dump them in Palestine. It was the anti-Semitism of Europe and the US that led to the need for Israel. The U.S. was afraid of the mass ex exodus of European Jews as early as 1920, when millions came from Russia and Eastern Europe after they were forced out of their homes simply because they were Jewish. The world body gave Israel to the Jews because Europe and America made it clear that Jews were not wanted here. When my parents arrived, Israel to Israel, 
Israel was starting to accept the Holocaust survivors. My family came on a ship to Israel a few months after the famous exodus. They were dropped off at a shack with broken walls and a floor full of animal defecation. It had no roof, but they were happy. They were safe. They, there was fighting and gunfire all around them. The Arabs didn't accept this world mandate to call this country Israel and to share it with existing Jews and those yet to come. They too did not want the Holocaust survivors to come to the Jewish part of Israel. They said all of Palestine was to be theirs and they didn't want to live with the Jews that had lived there throughout the centuries and the new ones that were there to return from the genocide. So five Arab countries attacked the new Israel. My parents heard fighting day and night. My father built a roof from wood of nearby destroyed houses. My mother disinfected the floors and they were finally somewhere. They were in the land where their ancestors lived, yet were thrown out century after century. They were home. Two years later, I was born. If it wasn't for Israel, they would, they would have had nowhere to go. If not for one country in the world, Israel, the only country where Jewish people were now welcomed, the only country that had been home to the Jewish people for centuries, I wouldn't be right here to tell you this. People in Europe in the 20s and 30s also couldn't believe a blood purge was possible in their enlightened age. The Jewish state of Israel is the only guarantee of never again. Israel was created and built by those who went through all the horrors one can imagine. Israel is the best monument to the victims of the Holocaust and heroes of resistance. Three years later, my family and I came to America on a ship because they each had one surviving sibling that had made it to America. They wanted to re reunite. I was three years old. Technically, I guess we were boat people. Uh, the, the third way that being a child of survivors has affected me has to do with my relationship to anti-Semitism. I'm very aware of and pay constant attention to the enormous rise of anti-Semitism in the world today. Was my mother right when she said on 9-11, it's another Holocaust? She's always told me how it happened gradually. The signs developed throughout the world, but no one could imagine what was to come. Overnight it happened and terror began. Governments rounded up Jewish people, physicians, judges, university professors turned against the Jewish people. Why? Because of a dream of a master race. Aryan-looking Aryan women were required to breed, and Jewish babies were loaded in truckloads to their deaths. Today, the effort on the part of anti-Semites is to get Jews out of Israel again. Being a child of survivors has led me to assimilate. I grew up going to church with my friends and their families because we lived in an Italian neighborhood in New York. In California, I meditated and learned a lot about Buddhism. But now, when I see synagogues being burned and vandalized all over the world, a United Nations that can't even declare anti-Semitism is wrong, a UN World Security Council that has 188 countries as members, including Saudi Arabia, Syria, Iran, Iraq, and only one country not eligible to sit on the United Nations Security Council, Israel. A 22-nation Arab League against Israel. With all this, suddenly, being Jewish means more to me. But my strong cultural heritage, no, not religiously, but my strong cultural heritage has jumped out of my skin. I felt very different than other American kids, even the Jewish ones. They all had big families that got together for the holidays. We didn't. Everyone was murdered. When I said the Pledge of Allegiance in school under God was everyone else's God. When I, uh, I felt very alienated and alone. Our family was all massacred, burned, or bombed. We were different. So I spent my days trying to be like everyone and hiding the grief my parents were hiding. 
My parents were orphaned children who tried to keep their younger brothers and sisters safe, fed, and alive during war, at least for a while. Arabs have done well claiming the indigenous status to the region, framing Israelis as European colonial expansionists. This is historically not the case. Jewish people were indigenous to Israel, and Israel is an indigenous people's success story. Jews have been driven from their lands, and they still return to their land. They built a desert of sand into a cosmopolitan high-tech mecca for the free world. This is truly a success story for indigenous people. To give you some perspective of what six million people means, there are probably about six million people in the greater Bay Area. I haven't checked with the census, and I'm not sure how many Northern California counties that entails, but think of the entire great, greater Bay Area as being exterminated. The Grand Mufti of Jerusalem, Hajj Amin al-Husseini, Arafat's close relative was in alliance with Hitler. Husseini was responsible for the Arab riots against the Jews in 1929 and also in 1936. He met with Hitler in 1941. Saddam Hussein grew up in his uncle's home, who was a leader of the Mufti's pro-Nazi coup in Iraq in 1941. The alliance between Arabs that deny the Holocaust and the Nazi, the Nazis began after World War II, when many German scientists ended up working in Egypt and Syria on weapons development. It continues with Arab deniers par parroting modern Holocaust deniers. Abbas, the current president, the current Palestinian leader, did his doctoral thesis in Moscow based on Holocaust denial. This is part of the thread that continues. My parents didn't talk about the Holocaust. They didn't want to burden their children. Occasionally, they'd share a story if I asked. I didn't ask often until we took a family pilgrimage to Poland in 1990, a month or so after communism lifted. My father had already passed, and I knew only a little about his experiences, but I went to his apartment and I saw my mother's house and family lot. It's mine if I want to spend a huge amount of money to lawyers to prove that it was taken away from my family. They owned it for generations. I have my grandmother's title to the property. The Polish note was taken. It still has our family name in huge letters engraved into the stone. We were one of millions that had our property taken by the Germans. Our property, which once had my parent, grandparents' buckwheat mill and family home, was given to the Poles after the war. I started asking my mother questions. My father was no longer alive to ask. Since then, I have an insatiable thirst to know what happened to my family, the grandparents, aunts, and uncles I never met, and the horrors that happened to my parents. Their legacy is in my dreams. <coughs> How did they wind up in Poland as Jews during such an ugly part of human history? When I went to Majdanek, a concentration camp in Poland, and there's pictures there, I was ashamed to be part of the human species after seeing the dissection tables, the ovens, and hearing the uncontrollable sobbing of my mother. She was my best friend and an incredible woman. It was the only time that I, in, in my life that I couldn't console her. This was not genocide for territory, revenge, or barbarism. It was an organized, massive industry of hate and torture for human beings. Exterminations were produced with architects' blueprints and by physicians that dissected humans for experimentation. Judges had okayed orders for mass exterminations and gassing. This was beyond the scope of humanity. I don't trust that it can't happen again. As a child of survivors, I was non-verbally raised to believe that if we are not very diligent, it could be right around the corner. These days are very frightening for Jews all around the world. Everyone should be paying very close attention, so should you. I'd like to end by clarifying the many twisted definitions you may have heard of what Zionism is. 
But before I do, I'd like to tell you that if you'd like to read my mom's book, I have a few copies with me to sell and cards that I can give you with the title. But it can also be ordered online or through bookstores. It's called When Tears Fall Short by Helena Ross. And so just find me at the end if you'd like a copy of When Tears Fall Short. The definition of Zionism is simply the determination of the Jewish people to return to their ancient homeland and rebuild their nation. That's it. It's, it became an organized movement, movement in 1897 with both secular and spiritual goals. Jews of different nations, ideologies, religious and secular, socialist and conservative, united and worked together to fulfill their common goal to recreate the Jewish state of Israel. Thank you.
Nacho en México, en Caral, en Caral, en Caral, en Caral. Ditto. <laughs> My sister might, if she had the opportunity, but I really don't know, and I'm, I'm actually the only one. My mother uh, did one time um, when she was alive, and it was very hard for her. Just took everything out of her. That's all? Come on. We know you have questions. Yeah? Um, I was wondering if, any, if you have any of the studies on like, the children of um, like, with the Nazis, like the second generation of like perpetrators. I don't know if you know if the experience is different. Like, yeah, I'd like to speak to that um, if you all want to add, but I did a little study on that. Um, when I went to the Holocaust Memorial Museum, one of my co-students was a Nazi son. And he now taught at the military academy and taught about the Holocaust and believed that it was his responsibility as a child of a Nazi to educate about all of this. And so he felt a commitment to doing exactly what we're doing so that it will never happen again. And he also taught at the uh, military academy of war ethics and uh, the issues about what the atrocities that were committed in the name of war. And so um, it has informed it. And there are many books you might be interested in looking at. And there are books on children of Nazis, what became of them. There's also books on women in the Nazi movement. And Myrna, weren't you just reading for sexuality and German Nazism? I mean, people are really starting to get into all kinds of other esoteric aspects. I don't know the name of the book, but if you look for the author, Daniel Barr, um, he's written a book about uh, both the children of survivors and the children of perpetrators, and compared their perspectives on the world, and it does probably what it's trying to, to know that they are somewhat similar. I also want to recommend a contemporary movie on this that is really wonderful. It's called Walk on Water. I was just going to say that. And it's about children of a perpetrator, uh, grandchildren of a perpetrator. And it's a current movie, you can get it out on DVD, and it's about Israel and contemporary, and an old Nazi and the fact that the family, the children, grandchildren are so appalled by having had a Nazi grandfather. And um, I won't give the plot away, but it's really a marvelous movie. Yeah. It's playing at the Riyadh right now. Is it still there? Yes. Go see it because it really is exactly to the question that you were asking. And it's filmed in uh, Berlin and Israel. Okay, you want to say something? Yeah, there's also an organization of the children of the high Nazis, the Nazi leadership, that have gotten together, and I have a book about it that is very interesting. What do they say, though? Well, they, they felt the need to communicate with people that had the same experience, and they, I read the book, they described, some of them went to South America, they described their lives, and uh, how their parents treated them and what they found out. I don't remember if it's in English or German, but I have it if you're interested. <laughs> but you know, the whole generation of the children of the Nazis has really dealt with it. That was the 68 uh, revolution. That was the revolution in Germany by the children who were are called those that were lucky because they were born after the Nazis. So that whole generation has been dealing with it for the last 30, 40 years. And that includes all the Holocaust education, all the movies that were done in the 80s and 90s about dealing with the past and inheriting this horrible heritage of your parents and grandparents. And many don't know what their parents and grandparents did, but it has affected all our lives for our life. How about other questions? Um, I was just curious if you guys had an opinion on when is, when, I know that sometimes it depends on personal situations, but when would be a good time to present discussion of the Holocaust or just education on it to children? I mean, it seems like Blair. such a horrific thing, and I don't know, being a parent, I was curious. Blair just whispered to me 
we've got to address that question. So why don't you address it? Um, well, I, my children have known about it since I felt they were old enough to understand. Um, Based well, on that personally? Well, my father, my father has an accent, you know, so they, they know he's not originally from here. And um, maybe 10, ten years old. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, students are interested. The United States Holocaust Memorial Museum has a permanent exhibition for children called Daniel's Story. You can buy the book. Yeah, you can buy the book, but you can go to the website, ushmm.org, and look for Daniel's Story if you're interested. And I'd like, I'm sure you won't want to say something, but I want to say more about it too. Um, more often than not, for children of survivors' children, you know, right? When did you know? We have a, daughter, a third generation Maybe here. Maybe 10. What, 10? Yeah. Right, yes. Yeah, my great-grandparents uh, are German uh, refugee survivors. They went to Shanghai. And I can just remember like, them always telling their story, just always wanting to tell their story whenever I was around. And um, my great-grandfather pays for my education just because he was deprived of it. So I just remember all this being done. And that's also a very unusual story to be told. The Jews that went to Shanghai and how Shanghai welcomed them and they didn't have any other way to get to about the children is that they generally, the children of survivors, they know. And when we were at the museum, um, there is a K through 12 educational program available, and they have modules to give to kids where, for little kids, you can, they'll show you the train. That's what I want to know about. So it can be as early as, you know, kindergarten or first grade or second grade. And that, sure, you're not going to show the movies, you know, with the corpses, but that it's not a good idea to protect children from it because it's a reality, and death is a reality, and yeah, you don't want to make it horrific, but you don't have to deny it to them as well. Well, I was going to say, and, and I'll address this to, to Mama, that I feel like, you know, I don't know what I can do to feel helpless, but after listening to my my ex-in-laws were survivors. My ex-father-in-law was Polish. My ex-mother-in-law, who's still alive, is, is Hungarian. And I was talking to my daughter, who's 20, and she's educated, she's going to Berkeley. And I talked to her, I said, I made reference to her, her grandfather being in the Holocaust, and she said, no, Mom, he was in the Warsaw Uprising. So after listening to that, and, and it, my, my ex-in-laws, um, my ex-husband had two brothers, and one of you quoted exactly. College wasn't an option for us. Education is high priority, but now what I can do is educate my children. Right. And if she didn't know that the Warsaw Uprising was the Holocaust, yeah. then you've got a lot to do. That's but just it. That's <laughs> well, and let me say, the thing to do, you don't have to be running off to Rwanda, although that's good too, and you don't have to be given money. All you have to do is to talk to people about what you've been learning in this class. You know, did you know, da, 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 did you know there's a genocide in Sudan right now? That is social change. Does anyone can I do all talking? My uncle was in the Warsaw Ghetto Uprising. He died in it, fighting. And I wanted to mention to people there's a poster over there. And what that is, is um, another uh, uncle who passed away, went all over the world to get the last surviving children in the Korchak orphanage, which was in the Warsaw ghetto. <coughs> and they were the children in Warsaw that were uh, being hidden and later on went to Treblinka. So those are all the, the living people in the world in this <coughs> Warsaw ghetto that house 200 children. And there's only one of them that's left alive. And he's somewhere in the north of Canada. So you might want to look at that before you leave, too. Please. I know that um, in Southern California Museum of Tolerance, I 
I've gone there when I was in um, elementary school, middle school, and high school. I went at least once a year on some field trip, and they have wonderful like visuals and and they have um, two separate things you could do. Like we also did it on slavery, and we also did it on um, um, freedom rights and all that stuff. We have this museum to arms, but um, I they had videos for children and they had videos for adults. Mm -hmm. So I know that, and they had survivors speaking, and they had survivors that would speak directly towards children, and, and had speeches for children, and then they had speeches for adults. Yeah, I want to follow up on that. There were often uh, survivors, or, or children of survivors, who go to public elementary schools mm -hmm. to give these talks, too, so that, you know, they, it, it doesn't have, you don't have to wait until you get to college to study. Mm -hmm. Yeah, they, they don't want to privatize it. That's on which state, by the way, in New York, they, 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 they do bombard you in New York. Go ahead, please, let Blair want to finish. As far as you know, like my children and children of um, third generation, I guess, the more natural it is, you know, you don't want to say, okay, honey, you know, I, I, we need to have a talk. You, know, you just want it to be something that, and as you heard my son say, I don't remember when I first heard about it. You know, it's just something that's always there. And I think that when I first heard about it, it, it was just always there. Um, so you don't want to make it, you know, okay, you know, let's have a talk about your family history. Instead, you know, just a bit natural. Yeah, pretty natural. So just add to that. Uh, you know, my children um, have always known that their grandparents were survivors of the camps, and we didn't, you know, uh, make it some secret thing that the children of my children, my daughter, always knew about her grandparents. And I think it's important to, to talk about it today and um, to continue talking about it. Um, I am uh, a genocide survivor from Rwanda. Um, so when I, I heard your story, I just made a comparison between what you said and what happened in my country. Now, when that happened in my country, my children were between 7 and 14 years. Now, today, about 10, 10 years later, when, when we talk about these events, some of my children don't want to, to even to talk about that. So they are shocked. It, especially the younger ones, so the ones who were seven and nine don't want to talk about that. I'd like to answer that because there, the literature and survivors have told me this too, that there's a period of time, some say between 20 and 30 years for people who have extremely horrific experiences, that they can't talk about it. And so it's not uncommon that there would be that lag, because you're only 10 years out of it. When your children are older and they're talking to their children, then they'll probably be able to speak of the experience. And there's a silence. And in fact, a survivor once said to me, there's something in the Torah the, that says um, that you can only really be conscious and honor something 50, 50 years after the experience. And, and it's quite noteworthy that in the United States, we're really commemorating the Holocaust now, 50 and 60 years later. When I was growing up in the 50s, forget it, nobody talked about it. You know, it was just, oh, my uncle who had a funny accent and a tattoo on his arm. And it was that we knew what happened, but it wasn't the public commemorations or the public visibility that there is now is a private silence. So yours is probably going to maybe go through the same process. So I have another concern that uh, someone mentioned in the in our talk that uh, well, she was not sure that uh, this would not happen again. Now, uh, <coughs> so I have a concern because now in Europe there is a, what they call a neo-Nazi movement and in, the, in, in Toronto, the town I'm coming from, some, some months ago, um, so, so some people were anti 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 Semitists, so they went to well, to the, the Jewish uh, to uh, memorial uh, monuments or 
the Jewish uh, uh, cemeteries so by night, and they wrote uh, slogans and things against the Jews. So when I see that, I fear that this uh, hatred is still in the hearts of some people. Mm -hmm. Okay, I, I have a respect. Leave it to a teacher. I always have a response to something. Um, two things. One, there, the, the Holocaust literature says never again, and in fact, or never again to the Jews. Well, the never again we know happens because it happened to, to you, it happened in Cambodia. It happens. The question is, will it never again happen to the Jews? Well, with the rise of anti-Semitism and what we've been reading about, it could happen to the Jews again as well. If, the, if countries can have the ethnic cleansing and the ethnic hatred that you've experienced, it would not be unlikely that it could happen again. And I belong to a Daughters of Holocaust Survivors group, and many of us have been having discussions about are things getting familiar in the United States to the conditions in Germany in the 1930s. And many of us are drawing parallels. The Patriot Act is an example. The suspension of liberties that many of us are familiar with. The election by a non-election of a president. <laughs> we could laugh about it. Some do, but it scares the hell out of me because their parallels are very close to what happened in Germany in the 30s. Um, I'd like to raise uh, the issue. Um, I know you mentioned that, that there is a hierarchy of survivors, um, death camp survivor, refugee, etc. I would and feel that the Holocaust had an effect on that every American Jew, or every Jew, is in some sense a survivor of the Holocaust, in the sense that it affected us as young people as well. I grew up without any direct knowledge of a survivor in my family, but incredibly uh, it, you know, sensitized to the Holocaust. And I would suggest that every German child is also a survivor of the Holocaust in the sense that they too live with the understanding of their own ethnic participation. So in some sense, it doesn't surprise me that they define, that many of the great thinkers, modern thinkers, define the modern age as one of a post-Holocaust age. It's not just for Jews, it's for all of us. I would suggest that there is a debate about what you just said. And some people I know would argue with you vociferously because some folks have said to me, you cannot be second generation. You happen to be a daughter of a survivor, but nobody can relive the experience that those people relived, that those people lived through. And it's absolutely true. And so, you know, to so the, the purists would argue that what you've just said is too generalizable and doesn't really make it pure and clean about what really happened to the, to the people who experienced the, the Holocaust. I happen to agree with you, by the way. I'm just giving well, you that's why I get along so long. Yes. Because <laughs> <laughs> I agree with you. Okay. How about others? Oh, there's more. Good. Yeah, um, I'm so mixed up in all of this because uh, as a child I didn't ever live in the Jewish community. I was the outsider and very often chased home from school and beaten up because I was a Jew. I wasn't even sure what a Jew was. I mean, we celebrated Christmas, although we didn't have a tree ever. We put the presents on the table under a cloth. Uh, I mean, but, so I really never lived a Jewish life. And I was thinking of Blair and her children, and I was thinking, um, how do they feel? I mean, I know how I feel when I hear anti-Semitism and anti-Israel comments, particularly in <coughs> universities. I mean, it scares the hell out of me. And I was wondering, what do your children feel or hear when they hear these <coughs> kind of things? 
They're both very strong in their Jewish identity, and they've been able to. Uh, my son, I, he goes on some chat boards and or chat rooms, and I know there was one where there was some anti-Semitism, and he just wrote back, and you know, fortunately, he's bright enough to know, you know, how to respond, and he just, you know, kind of agreed with this guy. Um, so I, I think. If you educate kids in their religion and their values and who they are and make them proud of it and not to make them ashamed of it, then they can respond. Um, my daughter is, well, she just turned 13 and she hasn't really experienced any anti-Semitism. Um, but doesn't she hear about it on the radio or through the news? Yeah, but it's, it's not real to them. And unless it hits home and unless it happens here in Santa Rosa, we're out of the Santa Rosa. It, it, it's not real to them. Um, I, I think for my son, because he's almost 16, it, he's more aware of it. And you know, it, to him, it's like, why would someone not like me because of my religion? You know, it, it's just hard for them to fathom and, and just hard for them to understand. But I think because they are so grounded in their Jewish identity, they can stand up for themselves and not cower in the face of it. But I, I know my son, when he did get into a little discussion with someone, he stuck up for his rights and he was able to say, you know, here's where it's at. My only other comment is I, I identify with the uh, uh, Dean uh, Peter in that um, I came out of fighter. I mean, I didn't have any Jewish background until I became married, divorced, and had children. And all of a sudden, my background was <coughs> to me. And I work within that community now. I mean, it's very important to me to have this, this identity. Uh, but I, I feel like a survivor in that um, I feel that I've been punished, victimized in many ways. Um, my daughter yells at me today because sometimes when I'm out away from my Jewish community, I take my star and I hide it in my blouse. And she's like, why are you doing that? You're so proud of being Jewish. Why would you hide your star? And I don't know why. In some, yeah. yeah, it's yeah. there in my, in my jeans. Yeah. No, I, love, oh, go ahead. Oh, I wanted to comment also um, that as growing up, I was afraid to tell anybody I was Jewish. I always wanted to blend in. I was it wasn't that I was ashamed, but I was I didn't want to draw attention to myself. And it wasn't until I had children of my own and I realized that what am I going to give to my children? This is my heritage. This is what my grandparents died for. So I gave them their Jewish education. They're not religious, but they know that they're Jews. And um, they're not afraid to say they're Jewish. I remember uh, when my children were little and people would say to them, you know, do you have your Christmas tree or what are you going to get for Christmas? They would say, well, we don't celebrate Christmas, we're Jewish. And I remember feeling fear at first, initial fear, like, oh my God, don't tell them that. But they were proud of it. And through them, I learned that it's okay to admit that I'm Jewish and there's nobody going to take me away to a camp. So I just wanted to comment on that. I was just going to mention that um, you said how you were raised and you weren't religious as you were raised. My, my parents were in Russia during the Holocaust, or a great portion of it, and that was under Stalin, and you couldn't say you were Jewish. I mean, there was no religion, because it was communism. So we were raised very secular when my parents came to America, they had a lot of uh, Stalinist viewpoints. So it was more of a cultural identity, but they were Holocaust survivors. So religion wasn't part of our family, but there was some thread that held us together very strongly. And it was a Jewish cultural identity, which was different than religion. Please, you want to say something? Michelle, I wanted to say something feeling of being different. I think one thing I think that we need to separate, being different or being inferior. Being different does not necessarily mean we're inferior, right? Which is different. Okay. 
But as a child, I didn't know the difference. Right. Right. No. No. And my son thrives on the difference. You know, he likes being different. So for him, this is another thing that's like, yes, you know, I'm Jewish and I'm different. And, you know, he loves that. Being different may be exotic. Right. Yeah. yeah. How about anyone else? Well, I'd like to close just with a, a little statement because I feel I would like to really encourage all of you since you've learned this whole semester about all that you've been studying around genocides and holocaust, that now that you are educated, you have a responsibility because we are just who we are, but from one seed, of prairie, one spark of prairie fire grows, which is what Nazi Tung once said, uh, mixing my metaphors, but nonetheless, I would hope that all of you would take the information you've learned this semester and do something with it, even if it's educating your own children. So, thanks.